Hi, let's talk a little bit about Hooke's Law. On this spring, that would be the unstretched length. And then as we put a mass on it, you can see now the stretched length. So if we take the unstretched length and subtract it from the stretched length, that's how much the spring actually stretched. And then we can do some neat stuff with it. So let's check out Hooke's Law. Hi, this is Keeley, and let's talk a little bit about Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law is not so much a law, it's more like a guideline. It works fine as long as we don't mess up the spring. So as long as the spring's acting normally, that we haven't stretched it too much or damaged it somehow, Hooke's Law works pretty good. And the way it works is it relates how much force is exerted on the spring and how much the spring either stretches or compresses. And the reason why that negative sign's there is because this is a restorative force, which means if I pull this, this block this way and stretch the spring, the spring wants to pull back the other direction. If I compress the spring, the spring wants to push back this way. It wants to go back to normal. Same thing over here. If I pull this down, the spring will want to pull up. If I push up, the spring will want to push back down. And so it's always a restorative force, and that's why the negative sign's there, because it's, it goes against what you're doing to the spring. So a couple definitions here. X is the distance we either stretch or compress the spring from its rest length. Um, K is a spring constant. That is different for each spring, and that's actually how you order a spring is by the stiffness. In other words, strength of the spring. And F is the force on the spring or from the spring itself in newtons. So let's take a look at an example. Okay, I've got a two kilogram mass attached to a vertical spring. The spring has a constant of 250 newtons per meter. And I want to know how far that spring will stretch. Well, the way it works is like this. When we put that on there and let it stretch, not let it bounce and just let it see how much it will stretch, then we have this MA equals the sum of the forces. Well, since it's just sitting there, we just let it stretch. We're not letting it bounce around or do whatever. The acceleration is zero, so that's zero. And we get the force, which is the weight on the block stretching it, minus the force from the spring. And I put the negative sign there. I know there's a negative sign in the actual equation, but I like to put it there because I know that these two are going to be working against each other. Gravity is acting down, and the spring's pulling up. So I usually put it there. I usually don't like putting it with the actual equation itself. So I don't like when they do force, whoa, force on a spring equals minus kx. I actually don't like that negative sign there. I prefer it here. It makes more sense to me. But what happens is if we move this over, we get this, where weight will be equal to the force from the spring because it's in equilibrium. It's just kind of sitting there. So in this case here, We've got weight, which is mass times gravity. The spring force, which is kx. And then we can plug things in to figure out what's going on. So 2 times 9.8 equals spring constant is 250x. And so if we go 9.8 times 2 divided by 250, that means that spring will stretch 0.8 zero, let's call it eight meters. So about eight centimeters. Now my second part of my question is, what if we bump that mass now and set the spring to oscillating? What would be the period? Well, period is equal to two pi square root of m over k. So in this case, it'd be two pi square root of two kilograms divide by 250. So if we got two divide by 250, and then take the square root, then times it by pi, I'm gonna use 3.14, and times it by two, we get an oscillation of about 0.56. It'll go down and back up once every 5.6, or sorry, 0.56 seconds. 
let's take a look at another scenario. In this case, we have an unstretched spring that is 0.2 meters, so sort of like what in the, in the introduction. We put a 3 kilogram mass on it, and now it has a length of 0.35 meters. We want to know the spring constant of the spring. Well, we first need to do, since we've got an unstretched and a stretch length, we need to figure out how much it actually stretched. And so it actually stretched, let's see, let's call it delta x, the difference in those two. So 0.35 minus 0.2. So it actually stretched 0 0.15 meters. That is what we're actually going to use when we do the calculation. So, I'm going to take, let's see, again, we're going to do zero, because it's not accelerating, we just let it stretch, it equals the force from the weight of that block minus the force from the spring. And so, Fg equals Fs, that's mass times gravity equals kx and we're looking, actually looking for k so let me come over here we got 3 times 9.8 equals k and the stretch is 0.15 meters so 3 times 9.8 divided by 0.15 gives me a spring constant of 196 newtons per meter. And that would be the spring constant for that spring. Let's look at one final scenario. In all the previous scenarios, it's been a vertical spring, but what happens if we have something that looks like this, where the spring is horizontal? And so we compress the spring, and we want to know how much force is required to do that well, F equals, F from a spring equals minus Kx. This is another reason why that minus sign is not really necessary. But we have the spring constant is 400 newton meters, and we compressed it 25 centimeters, or 0.25 meters. 400 times 0.25, and we get that that would have taken 100 newtons of force to compress that spring that amount. Easy enough. All right, thanks for watching, and tune in again, and we'll do some energy in the spring.